Okay, Steve Langasek and Andy Bald. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Natty. Uh, my name is Steve Longashek. Um, this is Andy Bart, and we are Debian's release managers. I think we know many of you already. Um, if we don't, come by and say hi and introduce yourself sometime in the, the remaining days of DevConf. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about the release process as a whole, um, how releasing, how, how our work as release managers works, what tools we use in order to, to uh, facilitate that, what your role as developers ideally would be in order to help us get released on time, and uh, cover some of, of what um, remains to be done between now and being able to release Etch. So the last time I was uh, down in Mexico giving a talk, I, I asked the audience the question, um, do you think it's, uh, it's worth the effort to keep Debian ported to all 12 architectures um, and, and release in, in with that many architectures and whether that's a good idea? So then a month later, I went up to Vancouver, and we all know how that ended up. So I'm not going to be asking the audience any questions today, but we will have a discussion period in which you will all be welcome to ask us any questions that you might have about the release process. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Andy for this uh, first part of the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, now, so first, first we start with some, well, basically, what every developer should know, but we experienced that if that would be the case, you would have uh, much less issues. So I'm going to talk about it also th this time. Usually, if packages are uploaded, they are uploaded to Unstable. Um, and then they have some rough testing, something like 10, t 10 days. After that, they can go to testing as long as they don't break anything there. Um, yeah, and then from time to time, what we hope this will happen in December next, is the testing is declared stable, moved to stable, and the current stable is moved to all stable. And there's also experimental for packages that are not meant to go to testing stable. So if you make an upload of things where you say, oh, I want just to play with it, but it's not really meant to go into stable, please use experimental. That will help us much and also you. Yeah, and what's release management? What are we going to do? Basically, it boils down to make sure that the release targets, the release goals are met. We need to ensure the testing is not broken and doesn't get broken. Um, also, we need to keep the strings together. That means uh, when, when, when some developer starts to change anything, we need to make sure that all dependent developers know it. And if there's an issue, it gets communicated in time. Um, that seems to be rather easy to write on a slide. In fact, it's much harder to extract the information in time of developers. Yeah, and also just to collect information, distribute it again. It's, um, it's not so much about that we fix packages, what we of course also do, but more about we need to communicate, we need to deliver information. It's a task or, or a role which just needs a lot of communication. So the next slide is who are we? That are of course Steve and me. Then we have currently two release assistants. That is Joy Hess and that's Frank Lichtenheld. But we are currently about to, uh, to get more uh, assistance. We have currently somehow tests for them running. We called it task and skills for the release assistants, um, where we give them tasks to fix RC bugs, to work on build demon features, and so on. And we hope to see two, three, or even more new assistants coming up soon. Yeah. And of course, as a role account, so if you want to get in touch with us, please just write an email to Debian the, the lease at list Debian org. This address is public, so if you are more interested in the, the lease, you could even subscribe to it. But that's our generic role account, both for the edge release management as well, well as for the stable release management. And of course, there's a website, release Debian org, where we try to keep the information for you and collect it. Yeah, so we have some tools that we work with. Without them, it wouldn't be possible to manage the, the release in the way we do. There's, of course, for the testing migration, Brittany. That's a script um, which uh, shows which packages are ready to go to testing, updates the packages and then in testing as long as they don't break anything. 
and they are so called hints which we could use to make sure or to change the behavior to say, well, this package is, for example, not old enough, but we know it, breaks, it fixes some security issues, it should go in now. Or where we can say, well, this package shouldn't go into testing at all currently, that is so-called uh, block hints, which we will also use to make the base freeze later on and after the base freeze even for the full freeze. So that's all just by changing some text files and not by changing the code anymore. Yeah, then we have another very important tool that are the least critical bugs, um, which apply to the normal packages, of course, but basically ever the least critical bug means there's something that we as the release managers needs to make sure it's taken care of before we can release. So the least critical bugs are nothing bad about a package maintainer in the first place, but just marking to do items that needs to be handled. And so if you get the least critical bug, Please don't just close it because you think it's an unfair treatment, but if there is valid reason, perhaps even if it's not in your package, then write to it and say, I doubt it's in my package, but um, yeah, um, but, but if it needs to be handled, it needs to be handled. So then we have the security status and testing, where what Joy Hess is doing. Um, and, and of course, also, we have a lot of scripts and small things that help us with the lease management, uh, starting from tools that just show the difference between testing and unstable, um, making it easier to get some hints written, and so on. Okay, and how packages go into, te go into testing. The preferred way is always, always via unstable, even if we are in, in the deep freeze. And the basic reason for why packages should go via unstable and not via testing or post updates is they get way more testing and unstable and uh, if something breaks, we will notice it earlier and also it's just a more natural way to, that happens that we have unstable and testing and then sync after that and not have some, having something different in, in unstable and testing. Um, also, we could use testing the post updates, but for that we only allow very minimal changes and only if we can be very sure from reading the diff that nothing is broken gets, gets, or gets broken by the change. Yeah, Split is a testing migration script runs shortly after deinstall usually. Um, deinstall is, okay, I don't know in this time zone, in my time zone is in the late evening, my time zone is Europe. Um, and after that, uh, Britain is run, we can see the results directly, the results are also published on the web um, and we could see run Brittany during the day if we consider it important enough, if there's something to fix or if we just noticed that uh, we are, or if we try to get a bunch of packages in which need some manual treatment, some, as, we, as that happens sometimes. Yeah, and yeah, that's all on that slide. So I will now give the microphone to Steve again. Okay, so the mails that have been sent out on Debian Devel Announce, if you read that, or that have been copied onto Slashdot, if you only follow Debian News via Slashdot, say that we are aiming for a Debian, a time-based release schedule that will have us releasing Debian in December of 2006. That's this December. Um, we do, of course, have certain issues that have to be addressed before we can release at all. And so we set this, this timeline early on so that we could get people addressing those issues that we identified shortly after the Sarge release as being the blockers for Etch so that we could you know, get those out of the way early on and not be in the situation as we were for Sarge where we had unresolved issues that prevented us from releasing Sarge that, that we could not release Sarge without resolving those issues first. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that was not the situation we found ourselves in this time. Uh, so we identified really only a handful of blocking issues for Etch that were anything other than release critical bugs. And you see that list here. Um, the tool chain, we, we did mark the, uh, what was the GCC4, the GCC4 tool chain transition, which included a C++ ABI change that was marked as a release critical, a, a release blocker. Uh, the X.org transition, we said we would not release Etch with X386, since X386 by that point, um, even when we released Sarge, I think there had been other distributions that had released with X.org already, um, and so it was a, a dead code base for all intents and purposes um, as far as the free version of that was concerned. So we said 
absolutely we had to get XORG into etch. Uh, the docs in main question, which is regarding uh, the, the clarifications of the DFSG and social contract and what that meant for documentation license, what that meant for licenses of documentation that was in main and whether we would have to work to relicense some, some documentation or get that documentation uh, unfortunately pulled out of main if that were the case. Um, as well, the firmware in main issue, which is, you know, it's a similar question. Now we have uh, lots of uh, device drivers these days that require firmware, which is not available in source form, uh, probably never will be. And what we're going to do about making sure our installer is still functional and can install on the hardware that people have to use in the real world, uh, how we're going to manage that, where the packages are going to sit, and, and how we're going to provide infrastructure for all of that and get that all sorted out. The mirror split uh, was was listed as a, as a release blocker simply because it was uh, a precondition for getting AMD64 into the archive and if we wanted to release Edge with a, a AMD64 as one of our support, supported platforms then we had to do the architect the, the mirror split first um, which has now been completed both of those um, AMD64 is present now in testing and unstable on the official mirror network, although the testing, you can, you can de-bootstrap it, but you can't really install any useful software with it yet in testing. Uh, something about XORG 7 blocking things just a little bit. So, but we're working on that. And secure apt, which is requiring authentication, uh, PGP signed, uh, P PGP authenticated releases files that, that uh, allow you to verify the authenticity of the packages that you are downloading. So as we say there, most of these are resolved. The tool chain, XORG, those are completely resolved. The mirror split, AMD64, we know those are done. So the things we still have on our plate from that list are docs in main, firmware in main, and secure apt, which unfortunately look like some of the harder ones on there. Um, and that's something that, that we need help from everybody involved to help us, you know, get through those lists of, of documentation packages so that we know that the, the documentation we're shipping in Etch complies with the DFSG the same way as, as any other software that we ship in Etch. Um, but yeah, those are the, the only blockers that we identified. Then we did identify a number of what we called pet goals, which is uh, transitions that would be nice to have, changes that, that we encouraged developers and, and the respective teams to work on, but which we did not consider essential for the release of Etch. Uh, those included such things as the transition to GCC 4.1, to give a recent example, uh, the Python 2.4 transition. He puts it as a pet release goal. I, I think I'm not so keen on releasing with Python 2.3. Um, I'm hoping that we'll make that a non-issue by getting Python 2.4 in as the default very soon so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, other examples of pet release goals, uh, SE Linux support in the installer was discussed. Uh, Manoj is very happy about that one. We're, we've been talking about that a lot this week and what needs to happen for that. And you know, it, there are a number of pet release goals that we identified which don't occur to me right now. Some of them have already been pushed through and so they're no longer on our radar. Um, others, we have uh, maintainers who are working quietly in their areas to get those done. And the pet release goals are things that if you have something that is your pet release goal, feel free to talk to us about it as the release team. We will try to make sure you have the support you need, but ultimately it is up to you to make sure that it gets done by the deadline. So, yeah. Um, Boy, I don't know what this point was, Andy. More, more QA. Okay, the, the point about the next one is, we saw in Sarge, or in the end stages of Sarge, there's a lot of issues which were identified very short before the actual release, which could have been identified way earlier. For example, how do upgrades work? Do the packages really co-install together well? Do the packages leave graft over and so on? and there is happening much more QA. That's basically not something we as the least managers or the least team are doing, but what the QA team is doing. But for us, well, QA and the least team matches very well together. And last, for example, with the, with the PO parts, is a great helper there, which is one of the good things that happen now in Edge. 
Right, that's, uh, yeah, p uh, how do you pronounce that? Pew parts? Yeah. Pew parts. Uh, anybody who doesn't know this tool, it's a great tool for testing whether your package upgrades correctly from one stable release to another. Uh, it has hooks where you tell it basically what package you want it to install and attempt to upgrade, and it does it all for you. And then it gives you a list of what changed inappropriately between the old, between installing and uninstalling it, or it tells you if the upgrade failed or anything of that nature, which is a, it's a great help. And I know Lars has been following lots of bugs that he's found using that tool, uh, which is really great because it means that uh, the more bugs we find, the more bugs we can fix and the, the stronger a release we can have. Uh, other things that we've, we've been doing in the QA front, uh, Bill Allenberg has been actively doing a lot of comprehensive upgrade testing, I think, this time around, which uh, we didn't get to until late in the release cycle for Sarge, um, which he's, he's identified. Uh, he's also been working on the circular dependencies issues, which affect upgrades, and just in general, seeing how real-world systems cope with being upgraded, which has been very helpful because uh, you know, it's possible to have a system where you think all the, the package relationships individually are right and then app crashes and burns when you actually try to do the upgrade and says, oh, well, you want me to satisfy the dependencies of all of these packages while you're upgrading, so I'll uninstall X and I'll uninstall KDE and I'll uninstall Tex and there you go, you have a perfectly working etched system with no packages installed anymore. So we hope to avoid that and, and provide as smooth as possible of a transition for Etch, uh, for as many people as possible. Uh, another point with Etch is that, uh, as I said before, the, the whole Vancouver proposal, um, we do have architecture qualification requirements this time around where if an architecture wants to be a release architecture, the porters do need to do some of that work, in fact, uh, the majority of that work to make sure it's it's not holding up the release on a number of different points. That includes things such as making sure that there are auto, auto builders available that are up and running uh, constantly and are able to keep up with the demand of newly uploaded packages to Unstable. It includes things like making sure we have a working installer for it so that if the, the porter machine for that architecture breaks, we have a way to reinstall it uh, down the line so that people can, can continue using it. Um, there's a variety of those requirements, which I won't go through all of them. They're actually on the release.debian.org site. Uh, but this has actually been a, a very good help for us. In fact, uh, there was a lot of controversy about that when it happened, when we first proposed it. Um, I know there are still some people that are unhappy with it, but the reality is that this has made a big difference in how we are able to manage the release because we are no longer spending many hours a day chasing down one architecture or another which is lagging behind. That's, that's, it's still occasionally we have to keep an eye on one architecture or another for specific packages, but we're no longer spending lots of time worrying about where the auto builders are for the architecture, for, for the release architecture. Uh, another change that, that's um, come about post Sarge has been the support, support for version tracking on bugs.debian.org. Uh, Colin Watson has uh, implemented a, a patch to debbugs which lets us keep track of what version of a package opens and fixes a particular bug, um, which makes it a lot easier to you know, track release critical bugs which were present in one version of the package. It may have been uploaded, but that version hasn't uh, propagated into testing yet, so it's not actually fixed in the release. Um, that's actually something which um, was a, a big problem in Sarge. Adrian Bunk uh, went through and, and did a lot of work for us, individually tracking down those RC bugs to see which ones were or were not fixed in Sarge. And we're hoping that version tracking is going to greatly reduce the amount of manpower required in order to find those bugs and, and get them fixed in etch in testing for the release. I think this is another uh, point I'm going to have to give back to you because I don't remember what this one is either. Yeah, what we did do is um, beginning of, of the Sarge release cycle, when I joined the release, or middle of Sarge release cycle, when I joined the release team, there only very few things that we could say to Brittany and we got to more and more things that we are able to 
give Britain and say, okay, this, so we have more fine grown console what we really want to do, which just helps so that we don't make mistakes because anything that can, could be checked by the software instead of me manually helps me. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I remember now some of the hints we added for Brittany in the release cycle. Can we save that question for the discussion, please? Okay. Um, so we, for instance, now have a hint which allows us to only override the urgency of a package so that we can say, yes, if this new version of the package it doesn't have any RC bugs that we didn't look at, go ahead and push it in before its 10-day waiting period is up. And so that's a, that's a nice shortcut, which means we don't have to you know, track the RC bug count for the package for a 24 hour period in order to be able to hint a new version into testing. We can just let Brittany take care of looking at, at the RC bug count like it's supposed to and not override that at all. Uh, further improvements we have in Etch is we do now have a pseudo package for release notes bugs. If you know of issues which you think need to be documented in the release notes so that we have information available for users when they are upgrading from Sarge to Etch, please file those bugs. Uh, that way we have a central place to collect, to collect that information uh, so that it can be included in the release notes for Etch. Which, which patent name is that? Release notes. The question was what's the package name? The package name is release-notes. We are also making a point to, as much as possible, use code names when referring to the release rather than using uh, suite names. We ran into a number of issues in, in the Sarge release where lots of references were hard coded to testing. So we had to, con we had to change from testing to stable in lots of places um, to do the release. And, in, and as much as possible, if we can use the code name, we prefer to because then that can, doesn't, that's one less thing we have to change in order to do the release. It, it just works correctly after, uh, after we change the symlink. And we're going for a, a shorter and smaller base freeze for Etch than we did for Sarge. Of course, lots of people have looked at the schedule and thought, well, actually, we're doing kind of a long base freeze. But the reality is, if you remember back to Sarge, base ended up being frozen for about a year while we were sorting all of the issues out. So this is in fact uh, quite a bit shorter and it's, it's what we believe is the, the minimum required base freeze in order to stabilize everything stage by stage. And we are also now, thanks to uh, the work of Ryan Murray, um, able to do bin and MUs in a much more automatic fashion across all architectures for transitions, which means that when a library SO name changes and the package name changes, but the dev package hasn't changed at all. It's just a, it's a small ABI change within the library. Uh, we as release managers, uh, together with the buildy maintainers, can go ahead and just queue bin NMUs or binary non-maintainer uploads to rebuild those packages on all architectures and the maintainer doesn't have to be bothered with it at all, basically, um, which is very nice because some maintainers it seems to be a bother for them because they don't, you know, respond immediately. Um, and this, this is, it streamlines the process, um, allows us to, to move a lot more quickly on, on some issues. Uh, further things that we, we have planned uh, to improve these release processes uh, is that we are looking at some enhancements to Brittany which would um, reduce the dependencies uh, between packages, uh, between the transitioning of packages for shlibs or um, so name changes where we would actually uh, have Brittany keep around previous versions of libraries in testing so that we could have both the old and new library package names in testing which would allow us to do a bit by bit transition of packages that use the new SO name into testing rather than what we have today where if a library like say lib free type changes its SO name you get a panicked email from a release master uh, release manager posting to DDA saying okay we have 600 packages that are depending on this library and its SO name is going to change we need some help 
Fortunately, that one did not come to pass. Um, the SO name change was reverted, finally. Um, but that's the kind of scenario that we want to avoid, where when you have more than about five different packages, or five or ten different packages using a library in Debian, and that library's SO name changes, you end up having to, to do a lot of coordination work in order to get those packages all into testing at the same time. And it becomes far worse when you have more than one library maintainer changing their SO name at the same time, affecting packages that depend on both of them, and not coordinating their uploads with each other. We'll get to another slide about that a little bit later. <laughs> so yeah, we, we are hoping that we will be able to improve Brittany to deal with some of that um, more automatically so we don't have to worry about it so much. Um, and we're also hoping to do a lot more QA work on packages for test for, for Etch, uh, improving them as, as much as possible, Proact proactively identifying classes of bugs which can be addressed, uh, can be identified and can be addressed prior to the release. Another point. <laughs> um, which point do it's a uh, better interaction? Yeah, basically, there's, uh, in, if you look back at Sarge, we had for the kernel a lot of different kernel source packages which, are, which were uploaded and uh, then you had the kernel wedge which built the UDAPs. And there are some discussions going on how to really how to improve it or it has already improved a bit because we now have only one kernel source package. This is done by the auto builders. And there's some more discussion. I'm not too sure about the details but one general thing how we like things to do is if the if the, if all of the maintainers that are affected by it somehow are happy with it, we are happy too. And so that's the way it's going to be there. I'm not so sure about details because uh, for example France uh, is really keeping track of it and so I don't need to. Okay, we're also uh, hoping we will be able to take care of in the etch time frame or it's at least on our list of things to do is get better UDEB handling in Brittany. Anybody who happens to maintain a package which builds UDEB or micro DEBs for use in the Debian installer is probably aware that their packages don't transition into testing automatically. The reason for that is that Brittany, the script that handles testing, does not handle UDEBs. And currently it's, it's not doing so because, of, uh, primarily because of some scalability concerns which we, we hope we can find a solution to, to address those um, so that we will be able to automatically process those packages and, and get those included in the transition into testing automatically. Currently what happens is after a package's source makes it into testing, an FTP team member has to go through and manually add the UDEBs to testing. So in order to make sure we don't end up with a source package getting into testing, it's UDEB not making it in with it. A new version of the package being uploaded to unstable and the UDEB disappearing before anybody gets a chance to process it, we have all of these packages that produce UDEBs currently in a freeze. Uh, so if you've ever seen any testing output about that, that's why. Um, I guess we have a question here. Uh, are there plans for publicizing some of the tools that I've seen coming up that uh, check libraries and <coughs> SH lib uh, versioning can automatically tell you when you're supposed to be bumping them or not? Yeah, the question, I'll just go ahead and repeat uh, a bit of that, was that uh, the question is about there are some tools out there for improving SH lib handling and allowing your, you as a library maintainer to know specifically and automatically whether or not you need to bump SH lib versions. Those are, there, there are some tools that I've personally been working on um, as a, as a result of my release team work in order to do that and it's just a matter of getting them, as you say, publicized and integrated somewhere that people can make use of them, um, which is something that I still need to tag a few people here for at DebConf before I leave and see where we can get to on that. Uh, checklist with dependencies, no out of order processing. We, we did have some problems in the Sarge release, which we are hoping not to repeat, where uh, we did not necessarily do everything involved in the release process in order. 
Um, some things, ha some steps had to be redone because we didn't realize there were other things that needed to be done first. So now with that experience under our belt, we hope that with Etch we'll get it right the first time. Um, we're hoping to be able to continue providing more up-to-date information on the release.debian.org website. Uh, Andy in particular has, has said he's committed to providing more release information on an ongoing basis on that website, which I think is absolutely great. Uh, we need to make sure that this time around, this comes back actually to dependencies, we need to make sure that when we build the CDs, we are building them from the final archive instead of trying to build them before the archive has settled because, well, one of the things is, okay, that means Etch is labeled as testing rather than stable, and we ran into some problems. If somebody remembers, I, what was it, 3.0R0A that came out three days afterwards? That's why. And we're hoping to yet integrate version tracking support into Brittany. Today, we do have support for querying the BTS to see which Version which versions of bug which versions of package carry a particular release critical bug We do not have the ability for Brittany to use that information directly in deciding Whether a particular package should be included in testing or not whether or not it's an improvement from the release uh, team's standpoint viewpoint uh, over the version already in testing And I guess we're going to be doing some final QA for release CDs and DVDs, which um, is another one of your points. Yeah, just we need some way to um, finally, oh, if it's my point, I prefer to stay with that slide. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, which is just, well, uh, uh, for the SARS release cycle, we didn't have to do any real QA. We didn't test install of the D CDs, DVDs. Um, which worked well, but we didn't look, for example, what exact line is for security Debian org in, uh, in the sources list, uh, which turns to be out to have been the wrong line, which even stayed after the search was released, and we don't want such repeats. I think this is a question by Thomas Okay, yeah, we have a question back here. Uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to make a pre release of the CD images? to avoid this uh, type of mistakes. In Woody, there was an issue too with the uh, Spark architecture, if I remember correctly. Okay, yeah, the question is, would it make sense to do a pre-release of images for the release? Um, the problem with that is things change between pre and actually releasing. You can't very well master a pre-release CD image and have it look the way the final release will look until the archive has changed around so that the current the version you're looking at is actually labeled as stable in the archive because the the Debian CD tools that we use today and the Debian installer I think I'm not sure Joey does Debian installer today does it look at exclusively at the code name okay so Debian installer is fixed for that but the Debian CD tools, I believe, still have some references where their behavior changes um, based on uh, whether, based on which suite it is, not just on which code name it is. So the problem is, you do a pre-release and you're doing a, a CD build of testing, which is not a good predictor of what the build process will look like when you're building a CD of stable. Well, it also applies to the things that we had before where I said we don't want to do out of order processing because basically what we did last time was to build the CDs a bit prior to the release to be able to check them a bit but the real issues that came up was well we didn't expect that there were real issues which then appeared um, because of the way the CDs are built. There would of course be a way to do it. For example we could say okay at some certain point in time we stop the daily installer, the daily uh, FTP master scripts running, so we did, don't get any new packages installed in unstable anymore. We could then change the stable and hide it on, a, on certain servers and do the CD builds for those first people. But if you look back at the last search release cycle, when it became a bit apparent that search is now going, really going to release, People were finding such images and CD images in all obscure places. For example, syncing the 
um, CD images around the world was delayed because some people get, uh, get noticed where the uh, CD images were put online for the other uh, mirror sites to get them from. So that was really bad and we probably need to put that even on a password protected server for some time to be able to, uh, well, to just be able to provide our mirrors with the CDs. So it's a bit difficult to do it. And also I think a lot of developers would be unhappy if we say, well, for one week, no more new process, uh, packages are processed. But of course, that would be doable. Uh, would it make sense to do something like uh, using Unif UnionFS during the freeze, like just do it mirror, test the thing with UnionFS, create the, the CDs, test them, and if that works, then do it in the, in the final release? Uh, well, I guess the question is using UnionFS to test um, the CDs prior to the release. Um, I don't see that UnionFS provides any distinct advantages there. Basically, one way or another, what you're doing is you're doing your test build from a modified mirror at that point, um, which means you're not testing using the real thing. You had to make a change locally in order to build it, and which may or may not, it's possible to introduce bugs there because you're doing this, the, the work twice in two different places. You may end up with bugs that may end up biting you later. Um, as far as pre-release CDs though, uh, I want to make sure everyone does know the Debian CD team does publish, I believe it's weekly um, ISO images of testing which include the latest version of DI at the time and includes all of the uh, packages that are available in testing. So we are doing a fair amount of testing of the CD builds on an ongoing basis prior to release. We also have the DI release candidates and betas, which have their own particular uh, ISO builds at the time, which are, you know, it's kind of a dry run at the build process of uh, the final release. The main difference is it's not building from stable because it's, no long, it's not yet stable, it's still testing. So those are the only real issues that we still have to work out there are identifying areas where the change from testing to stable breaks something. Okay, uh, moving on. This is the part where you all should be taking notes because these are things that you should be doing in your own packaging work to make sure that we stay on schedule. This is a collaborative process. This is not just the release team releasing Etch. This is Debian releasing Etch, and we absolutely need the help of every package maintainer in order to meet this goal. And part of what we need you to do as maintainers is just simply keep your packages in good shape. This is a, a simple request. Um, not everybody interprets it the same way, I suppose. You do have to you know, keep on top of your bugs, make sure that you do a level of testing of your packages that you're comfortable with. If you feel that you're not uh, able to keep up with bugs on your packages, then please, by all means, ask for help, whether that be a request for adoption in the WNPP, a, a, a RFH request, request for help, whatever that may be, whatever it takes to make sure that you know, we're all working on this together in order to make sure that packages are ready to go for the release and, and that we don't end up finding issues way too late, later than we should. Uh, you can also help with squashing RC bugs, whether that be in your own packages or in other packages. This is another uh, example of the collaborative nature of Debian work. There's lots of opportunity for people to help with release critical bugs. The, the list of release critical bugs is available online where you can go through them and see which packages you use, for instance, which packages you might have a particular familiarity with that you, you feel more confident working on release critical bugs in those packages. Whatever it is, there are release critical bugs for everyone. We have about uh, 400, actually it was 380, I think we were down to. That's great. <laughs> yeah, 20, 20 uh, bug reduction from when we came here. So about 380 release critical bugs that we are aware, aware of currently which affect the etch release. That's uh, more than enough for everyone in this room to get one. So please sign up for yours now. Uh, another thing that developers should help with um, 
when you're going to upload packages which make changes which are going to affect other developers, whether that's because you maintain a library and the library is changing its interface or whether that's because um, you're uploading a package which provides programs and their calling interface is changing completely or you're uploading a version which deletes programs from the package or moves them to different packages and you know there are other packages which depend on yours, please coordinate before you make uploads that, that implement these changes. You don't necessarily have to talk to the release team always. If it's a package which you know only has five, ten reverse dependencies which use it and, and there's no need to actually you know, do a massive coordination, well, you don't necessarily have to talk to us. It may help. We may be able to ease that transition into testing for you if you do talk to us in advance. But at least talk to the people who maintain the packages that yours depend on, that maintain the packages that depend on yours. Because if you don't, you may find that one of these maintainers is two days away from going on vacation for a month and there's his package blocking your package from getting into etch because you didn't coordinate ahead of time, he wasn't waiting for it, he wasn't ready and as a result, you know, you, it has to wait till he gets back or until someone NMUs. NMUs are a great tool for releasing, uh, for fixing release critical bugs. They're still a bit slower than actually getting the maintainers involved and letting it take, letting the maintainers take care of the packages themselves simply because the maintainer knows his or her package better than anyone else does and is always, almost always best positioned to do whatever uploads need to be done and, and fix bugs. Uh, yeah, read De Debian Devel announce before uploading packages as well. Um, we send announcements there. We let you know about transitions that are going on which uh, will be broken quite badly if you don't follow our directions in those cases. Um, it's, it's really painful when people ignore Debian Devel announce and as a result we have one week further delay for this package that was uploaded not according to the rules, another week delay for this other package that wasn't uploaded according to the rules, and so on and so forth. And when you have 15,000 packages in the archive, if, if people don't pay attention to what's going on around them, it becomes very difficult to manage uh, what's going into the release because everything is in a way interconnected and it, it compounds itself very rapidly. Uh, yeah, maintain your libraries in a good way. That, that includes, first of all, letting maintainers know when you've changed the interfaces, when you're changing the SO name of a library. Um, that includes things like making sure that when your library does change, it's, uh, it, when it adds new interfaces, that you do pump the SH libs. And that's something that we hope to, to provide better tools for you in the future to automate this. Um, it includes making sure you look at the new upstream version of the library before you upload it. And if the SO name changes, change the package name. Don't upload it under the same name because then all the packages depending on it throw an error saying, uh, yeah, no, no library found under this name. Well, its dependencies are satisfied, but the package satisfying the dependencies is completely broken. Has any, who here has actually seen that error before like in, in an upgrade? Uh, I recommend writing your package such that it fails to build if that happens. Absolutely. So it's impossible to make that mistake. Yes, um, that, that's a very good point. You, shouldn't, you should rely as much as possible on automated testing so that if your package isn't building what you're expecting to, it should fail to build. It shouldn't, you, wild carding your library names while convenient is, is not so convenient for the rest of us when, you know, a, a recent example was TASN 1-2 was uploaded containing libt as TASN 1-3, uh, which broke GNU TLS, which half the archive depends on today. Uh, kind of inconvenient when that happens. Um, so please, if you are a library maintainer, keep an eye on those kinds of issues. Um, if at all possible, your package should fail to build if there's an error like that that, that is a definite bug. If you have questions about how to do that, um, 
Well, I was going to offer myself to help him with that. Maybe I should just offer your services there. Oh, he's ignoring me now. <laughs> I was just volunteering you to help them if they have any questions about making their libraries fail to build. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly you can contact Debbie and Devell if you have questions about that. You can contact me personally if you feel that you must. <laughs> Debbie and Devell, though, does certainly have many people um, who, who have the knowledge necessary to help you, and most of them are more than happy to, to pitch in and make sure that our packages are future-proofed against changes upstream so that they are not going to break on us down the line. Yeah, so I tried to tell Andy this first one didn't really belong on a how every developer could help slide because this was actually an, an error that we as release managers made during the Sarge freeze process was that we second-guessed our freeze guidelines, which ended up letting a, a package in that included some changes which it shouldn't have and it broke a few things and we had to do a bit of scurrying around in order to get that fixed for the release. Uh, but in a sense, this does apply to every developer as well. Um, please don't second guess our freeze guidelines. If we say that libraries need to be coordinated, please please listen to us because there is a reason we say that. Um, it's not just that we like to be control freaks, it's that when we're not control freaks, then our lives are hell because we no longer have any control over anything. Uh, it, like I said, it compounds very rapidly when we do not have uh, coordination between library uploads and, and major changes in libraries due to the way Brittany runs today. Please don't upload packages to Unstable that are not targeted for the upcoming stable release. Unstable is not a dumping ground for experimental packages. We have a suite for experimental packages which happens to be called experimental. So if you would, please do not upload things to unstable, which you're not going to try to get into testing and, there, and from testing into stable. Um, that if it's a, especially if it's a package which is depended on by other packages, that makes it very difficult for us to do our job of getting updates into etch for the release. And again, please don't re-upload packages if there's an ongoing transition. Part of this comes back to library maintainers do need to be coordinating. Part of this comes down to uh, packages, maintainers of packages which depend on libraries that are transitioning also need to be pay paying attention to what's going on. And we have unfortunately had occasions where maintainers just were not aware that their packages were in transition even though they you know, had, had every opportunity to, to be aware of that. You want to take this one? Yeah, I want to. <laughs> so now is something to get motivated for the leasing edge in time. Lars already offered a bet that he will get tattooed with all the release names he worked on if we release in time or even earlier. I, I think we all want to make sure that this really happens. But if you have another bet you want to offer, we are of course also going to add it. So, any more bets? What do we do with this evening while drinking beer? <laughs> yeah, it remains to be seen whether Lars's bet is going to inspire enough people to help working on the release to offset his own stepping back from fixing release critical bugs, which he tells me that in order to hedge his own bets, as it were, he's not going to be fixing release critical bugs for us anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> so come on, people, step up and, and uh, help us get there. The question was, can he stop filing them as well? No. <laughs> I don't know. Do the, the bugs.debian.org admins have an opinion on that? Can or can't? Cool. <laughs> so it's just the final question, which is quite often asked to us, are we there yet? Not yet, but we could. Um, we have still way too many RC bugs with something like 380 RC bugs as of today, that there needs to be something done on it. We have still some decisions being prepared, um, but we hope that the, that the um, 
as I'd say, not too invasive, but still it will take some time. We have broken packages and unstable, for example, currently XORG, which, which uh, changed from a, si a single binary to the modular ones, is of course hurting us. Yeah, some packages are not as binary and MU safe, which doesn't probably mean anything bad to you as maintainers, but it means something bad to us as uh, release managers because we can't just schedule and bin and mute for, of that package if we need to. So, on the other hand side, we are some time uh, away from the release of Edge, so we, we still can make it. We can make it at the proposed time, but only if we really want, and we doesn't only apply to Steve and me, it applies to us all, to all different developers and package maintainers. I'd like to insert here as well a comment regarding bin NMU safe packages and what that actually means. Um, the reason packages become not bin NMU safe is usually because you have a source package which builds both an architecture all package and an architecture any package and declares a strict versioned dependency between them. Well, when we do bin NMUs of packages, we are only rebuilding the architecture any portion of the package. We are not rebuilding the architecture all portion, which means the architecture any package gets a new version number. The architecture all package does not, and as a result, the dependency is no longer satisfiable. So what we've, we've gotten, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that the dpackage maintainers have gotten a, uh, a change now into the latest version of dpackage in unstable where there are new, new variables available. Um, you can check the names of those. I think, is that mentioned in the dpackage change log? I'm not too sure, but I will make sure that it is um, set in the, in the next version of the release updates. Okay, so there will be a release update that, that mentions exactly what those, those uh, new variables are, but there are now ways to declare Yes, I want to depend on the, the source, the version of this package which matches my source version, my source package version, as opposed to the binary package version that I'm building, um, which uh, is going to help with those relationships between architecture any and architecture all packages so that we're not breaking down. Uh, okay, question. What is the issue with simply doing uh, source NMUs in those cases? The issue with doing source NMUs in those cases uh, is simply that they take longer to do. Um, given that we do have policies where you do not NMU prior to, first of all, filing a bug report so that it's documented, and then uh, once you file the bug report, you're expected to wait and give the maintainer an opportunity to react. Sure, but in this case, given that there are no changes, it's not necessary to merge any changes since it's basically a, a no-op upload, it seems reasonable to make an exception in order to allow the release process to continue. Sure. Um, I mean, that's a thought. Um. Well, also, a source uh, NMU is more work than just schedule a binary NMU, because binary NMU basically is be done by saying, for, for, for A in architecture, do bin, uh, uh, schedule bin NMU. So that's very easy to do. And also, sometimes, we don't need a bin NMU in all architectures, but just on one or two. And well, I think the bin NMUs are really a great thing to do. Um, and it's and actually most packages were not broken in that way, only where few are. Yeah, and that is, as he said, there there is a point there where occasionally we have breakage which is specific to one or two architectures where we don't really want to do a source NMU and push it out to auto builders for all 12 architectures because only two or three of them are affected. And in those cases, it would definitely be helpful if we can do bin NMUs for just the affected architectures and save ourselves a little bit of, of time yep. all around. I, I, there are certainly uh, good reasons in that case to do bin NMUs, but I think it's, it makes sense to have both options available because they have different characteristics. For example, uh, being able to, any, any developer can do a source NMU in this case as opposed to having to uh, be a build D admin, basically. Yeah, any developer can do a source NMU. Um, in my experience, it's actually faster for us as the release team. The turnaround is much faster if we schedule a bin NMU and just get it signed. It, it seems to actually work better. Um, it, it cuts down on the turnaround than having uh, a source NMU because even, even to have one of us do a source NMU, well, we have to go and pull in the build dependencies and build it on our system and, and so on and so forth and go through those processes um, regardless. And 
with a bin NMU, the auto builders are all set up. They all have their mirrors in place, and, and it's, it's just one more thing for them to do in the day, which they're already doing. All right, thank you. So I think the next question is here. Please take a microphone if you. OK. Who has the microphone? Okay. I have the microphone. I have questions from the people in IRC. Uh, first, Martin Sobel asks if there are plans on how to handle the late changes because Debian release uh, list wasn't scaling very well for the SARS freeze. So if how, how it will be handled for it? Tell people not to make any changes. Um, no, I'm, I mean, I can't think of anything that really promises a better solution than using the Debian release list because one way or another you basically end up with a queue of issues that have to be dealt with. It's, whether it's in someone's mailbox or on a web page or whatnot, I don't think it makes any difference unless we actually try to split those up in some fashion automatically, um, which is also tricky because then you have to, you know, fiddle with it to, to get it just right for people's availability, how much time they have to work on those issues, and so on and so forth. So I don't see that we can really improve on that where we simply have people mailing Debian release if that's, if they need the release team to do some work. I think that's really what we should stick with. Well, one thing why we hope that will get a bit better for us this time is, for example, we have done, we have reduced the amount that we have the base freeze, we have reduced the time amount that we have the real freeze, because basically as soon as something like that starts, we are on the release team, we are really, have a lot of mails go, going on to us. For example, if I remember correct, we had it's a real freeze, something like 30 to 40 mails per day requesting some package updates, which uh, basically means that every one of us has to work for something like two hours only on package updates per day, which is very, very much time. One thing that should help us as well with that is, since we do have version tracking in place, people don't need to tell us that they have release critical bugs that they've fixed in Unstable, which are still present in testing, because we can look at the release critical bug count and see that for ourselves. So they shouldn't need to send us any mails about that. And that was a, a fairly large percentage of the mails during the Sarge freeze was about okay, I fixed this bug, please let it into testing for me. Well, now we can go and see that without having to get a second mail about it. I, th I think we will have an automatic list of, of issues fixed in, in, in SIT but not in Edge, so that we can just go through this, this list. But that's something we, c we can just implement before the freeze, so it's not important as of today, but of course very important because, uh, just in front of the release. Okay, and a question from Martin Sobel. Uh, he says that there are still many arches that uh, have no real build D redundancy, and if that will change before the base freeze? Another comment. There was another <laughs> comment there that I didn't catch. I, um, build D redundancy is is certainly um, something we want to have in place for all release architectures. It's something that historically has not been in place, and so of all the requirements that we discussed in Vancouver that, that we've moved forward on, it's the one which we are enforcing the least strictly, simply because uh, you know we don't want to toss all architectures out of Debian for not having this, because the reason this, this requirement exists is it's a safety feature in case the primary build D goes offline. Well. It doesn't make sense to exclude a, an architecture from the release, to my thinking, if it has one build daemon and it's working and it's not failing, then why do we cut it out of the release before it fails? But what that means is if you don't have any build D redundancy in place, we're not going to be too lenient if it does fail and goes down for two weeks and you're not building any packages. We're going to say, okay, well, you were supposed to have build redundancy in place. You don't have it and this is what happens when you don't have it. So we have to cut you from the list of release candidate architectures at that point. So that's something for all porters to be worried about if they don't have build D redundancy at this point is you know, what happens if the build D fails and there's nothing to pick up the slack. But if you go through, um, so the redundancy 
actually is on some architectures running. The four site architectures that are service built in redundancy um, are MIPS, MIPS, the MIPSNs, the PowerPC, and SC90. Well, for example, EC86, I don't think it's too hard to find another mesh and suite as a new build demon if we need to. And basically, um, also, in, in case it goes wrong, uh, well, we might kick an architecture out uh, and fairly soon because they are basically supposed to. And also, this number of architectures with um, redundancy are going up and uh, up and up so that we have more of them having um, some um, redundancy. Yeah, I think uh, the fact that Spark is listed there as being only security redundancy, I think that may be out of date information now. I don't see James or Ryan here in the audience to ask them directly, but I'm pretty sure that we do have build these now that are building, that, that we have N plus one capacity on the build these for unstable at this point on Spark. Yeah, I, 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 yes, I think well, this table is just updated from time to time, and the number of, secure, of build demons was not updated so much. The only thing that we updated recently was the architectural status of, of ARM, because they basically failed to match our criteria and now match them again. Okay, well, I think we're actually done with all of our slides. Is that correct? Yeah, Thomas, Thomas yeah so slides, we are, we're fully in the discussion period right now. We have a question here with Peter, and then I saw Matt had his hand up over here, and Doko also. So if somebody can run microphones around as needed. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about uh, what you said earlier about uh, making a change uh, to Brittany to allow multiple versions of something in testing. Um, I assume that that will not happen in a stable release that you can't have multiple versions of the package in a stable release. So uh, do you also have a plan for a process to uh, then uh, eliminate the duplicate packages uh, when it gets close to release? Yes, um, that's a very good point, and I, I did in fact mean to mention that. The, the old versions of the library packages are only meant to be kept around for a, per a transitional period. The idea is that Brittany will automatically remove them as it always does when nothing else depends on them anymore in testing. So the solution for getting them out of testing for the stable release is make sure nothing depends on the old version, whether that's by removing any packages that have failed to transition correctly or push expediting new packages in that use the new version or what have you. But yeah, um, we're not going to be releasing with two source versions of packages, of library packages in a stable release. Uh, but that's certainly something that should be manageable once we freeze. Um, that we should be able to knock through all those issues fairly quickly. It's, we don't have support for it in Brittany yet anyway, so that's somewhat down the line at this point. Yep. Uh, I'll be very quick. Is there a um, bug squashing party, bug squashing night scheduled for the conference? And if no, is it worth making one? Well, it would be worth thinking one um, if we would have proper net access. You, you mean every night isn't bug squashing night here? What are you people doing? <laughs> Bringing strong alcohol? I noticed. <laughs> okay, another question from IRC. Martin Kraft asks, if maintainers of UDEP packages are supposed to do something about the testing block that you mentioned earlier, or if that was just information? Okay, yeah, the question about um, whether maintainers of UDEB, UDEB packages are supposed to do something. Well, it would be helpful if they would email Debian release when they think their package is ready for an update in, in testing. Um, we, I think, periodically scan for those, or not uh, so periodically. Uh, I'm not saying something about how long the periods are, but we are doing. Right, so if you have a package that, that builds a UDEB and you want it in testing, email Debian release and we will, we will push it in for you. It's just something that we have to know that someone on the FTP team is available to do the other side of it once we've done that. So, well, uh, a lot of work uh, seems to be done uh, for the release in getting packages from unstable to testing via the Brittany program. Um, currently I see uh, it's much work for the release team, uh, but recently um, the release team asks people and package maintainers to uh, actually uh, tr uh, reduce, to trying to, re to reduce the number of dependencies for uh, packages by splitting source packages into multiple uh, smaller units with less dependencies. 
that uh, enforces some work on the package maintainer for uh, well some deficiencies deficiencies in the um, transition process from unstable to to testing. Um, is there any um, well? For my thinking, that only uh, cures some some symptoms uh, about the transition process. Is there some some work being done um, in well uh, uh, simplifying the transition process? From well, yes, we've identified the issue with keeping old versions of libraries around um, during a transition period. That would greatly simplify a number of our transitions. But I don't think I agree with your premise that we're asking people to make changes to their packages which only benefit the testing process. Um, the Things like reducing the number of libraries your package depends on when it doesn't use them, those are things that, that benefit not just the testing process, that reduces the number of times we have to rebuild the entire archive for stupid reasons. Um, because if a package isn't using a library, that library changing should not require a rebuild of the package. Bin NMUs are one thing that make it easier to rebuild the package, but it's still wasted work that we shouldn't have to do at all if, if packages you know, depended only on the libraries that they actually needed for operation. Um, one example which may support your position is that recently, recently I did ask the Avahi maintainers to not ship C# -sharp bindings um, from the same source package as the C bindings that all of KDE and GNOME depend on. Um, so I'm not sure if I would say that's that's uh, you you could argue that, that that supports your position that it's a change that only benefits testing. Um, on the other hand, I think it benefits, benefits the release in general because the reason I asked for that change was because the C-sharp interpreter, the C-sharp packages were not in a stable configuration yet. They were going through ABI changes and holding things up as a result of that. So if we have language bindings for a language which is still in transition, we do need to have the option of pulling the language and things that depend on it from a release um, if, if things are not releasable at the time we go to etch. Yes, I did just say we should be able to pull C-sharp out of the release if it's broken. Um, then many people ask about the status of Debian Volatile. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you uh, said. Debian Volatile okay. and, and the outlook after Edge, the status for Edge and... and okay, I think, I think that's now a question for me to answer about. Um, basically, I think Debian Volatile has some other, oh, one of the great benefits of Volatile is that we can push pack new packages in as soon as they appear, if their target is stable, whereas for a point release, we can just do a point release every few months. So for example, for something that really moves as fast as Klamath does, we need something like Volatile, because obviously we don't want to put a new version on security if it doesn't fix security bugs. So I think we will continue to use Volatile. There has been discussions whether to add just the latest version of Glamav to point releases also, but that's not decided yet. And basically our approach as stable release managers was that we just got uh, two out so that we have a lot of packages now as part of stable. And then said, okay, for R3, we want to work on the uh, kernel pack, uh, on the kernel updates, which needs some uh, help from the Debian installer people, and all the rest of good ideas is then move to L4. Uh, to, the, to the 10 minutes apply to only the, the talk or to talk plus discussion? <laughs> ah, bad. Okay, I, I can see Joy has. I, I got one, thanks. Yes, one. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, we have redundant building machines for uh, HPPA and I64 that are in the process of being set up. They're not turned on yet, but the machines exist and, and should be soon. Um, we're also working on getting a uh, uh, redundant building machine for Alpha, so uh, a few more of those boxes should turn green, and I think at that point there will only be a couple left that aren't, and it should still be a, a good release uh, uh, requirement. Well, basically, what, if you look at the field, the green one, one means our requirements are fulfilled. So that one says there is something broken. Uh, and, the, and the yellow ones means, well, actually, it's not like we would like it, but we could live with it for the moment. 
Okay, next question, I think, Joy. Um, I was just wondering about the firmware issue. Um, if we have any idea when that's going to happen, and et cetera. Okay, the question was about the firmware issue. Um, yes, I wonder too. Um, basically, this is one of the rather bad things that we need to work on, and which is really a re release blocker, because we have decided, or the majority of developers has decided, that starting from Edge on, um, we need to make sure that everything in Debian, being it documentation, firmware or so, needs to be, uh, or the DFSG applies to it. So, yes. I think it'll take about um, t a month or two for the installer to be updated to support um, non -free. We get it into after it's kicked out of the kernel. So then. Uh, I agree with your choice that this is really one of the things that could delay the, so the, the least, so we need to work on. I had some discussions with Franz here about it. Um, yeah, but we need to work on that definitely. So, next one. Ah. M68K is listed as having 15 build demons and, well, uh, uh, and uh, still only uh, redundancy only for security. What's the problem with that? Yeah. Well, basically, if an architecture doesn't keep up, how can we say it has redundancy? It keeps up with security um, fixes, so it has redundancy for security, but it has no redundancy for the normal archive because it even can't keep up. Uh, that particular entry, though, I believe is about four months old at this point, four or five months old. I don't think we've reviewed recently how M68K is keeping up. Uh, um, the, the view how much it is keeping up, and it's still not keeping up. Uh, well, is that actually that it's not keeping up with packages or that it has a bunch of packages that are in failed because of compiler issues? Well, we could check up now, but uh, anyways, we, M68K is cu currently, at least with GNU-C 4.0, not in the release candidate. If we move on to GNU-C 4.1, it might change that, but that has to be seen once we are done with GNU-C 4.1. Right. Yeah, my understanding, based on conversations with several of the M68K porters, um, including um, Adam Conrad and Ingo Jurgensman, is that um, at the time we were reviewing that, they were still in the process of bringing some faster M68K build these online, which would allow them to keep up better and reduce the number of build these required. I have not reviewed since then how they're actually keeping up with the package queue. Um, I know they're their count of current and built packages is low, but I, I know there are a number of compiler issues that are blocking them there as well. Well, basically, GNU-C 4.0 is not good for M68K. Uh, Bauter says that M68K is for packages that do build. Yeah, let me go ahead and repeat that since that microphone was cutting out on her. That uh, Wouter was saying M68K is indeed keeping up now with those packages which M68K is able to build. It's just a matter of the ones that can't build due to um, architecture specific tool chain issues. Next one. Uh, good. Lars has one. Um, uh, just a small point that the same thing applies to the ARM consideration in that there's now five buildies, um, which I think probably counts as adequate redundancy, but you have to decide. Uh, oh, yeah. Something has improved on ARM, it's just not on the slides. But in, in any case, you notice that anything is wrong on this, this page. The easiest way for us to, to fix it is, is if you send mail to Debian release because then it's definitely in a very prominent place in my incoming mailbox and I will process it. Okay, we seem to have about five minutes left here before the end of the discussion period. So anybody has anything else they want to discuss? Um, and Lars apparently does. Yeah, I would like to know what uh, font you want me to use. 
What, what did you say? He asked what font he wants us to use on the tattoo. I think that is a decision we need to make in a Kabbalistic manner. <laughs> yeah, do you want a GR about that? Should we act, ask the tech maintainers for, for yes. advice? <laughs> Okay, I can see another question. Um, oh, f funk. Um, the project secretary wishes me to announce that there is a moratorium on GRs until SE Linux is completed in Debian. <laughs> I see the DPL is not happy about that. Um, <laughs> so maybe there are some in planning. Um, is there a point in the release schedule already for uh, keep uh, for uh, choosing the new release name for the next release? Yeah, actually we wanted to do it yesterday evening, but unfortunately I was sick. We, it should have been on the last slide. Uh, yeah. uh, would you? Pardon? Um, I have one uh, name in my mind, but we didn't agree on it yet. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that character is also in Toy Story. Yeah, for those who don't know, the two remaining characters in Toy Story 1, the movie, which are toys and are named on screen, are Lenny, the binoculars, and the remote control car, whose name I believe is RC Buggy. <laughs> <laughs> So we really think we're not going to use that one for a release name. <laughs> yeah, has everybody seen the new Debian buggy release? <laughs> okay, my. <laughs> yeah, uh, would you consider trying to block acceptance of packages that are involved in transitions rather than just relying on maintainers doing what they're told? Um, basically, I think it would be a bad idea to, to actually enforce it via the, um, via the FTP te team's tools because actually, at least my expectation of developers is that they are all, well, all know how to do it and should be able to listen. And if you say, well, we can't just this maintain and not upload during uh, the transition time, uh, or we say, well, he, he says a maintainer that usually breaks us some, some parts. We really should consider if it's, if it's there's not a better option, that is to remove upload sites at all. Well, yeah. sure, but no one's doing that yet either. So. Right, it's also, we've discussed this before, and it's been my impression, AJ just shook his head at me like he was surprised we discussed this before. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we discussed before the idea of, of doing something like this. Um, people have suggested it in the past. It really seems to me that it, it's sort of a wash um, if we have to go through and coordinate with the FTP masters to have people blocked from uploading particular packages, only to have that, only to turn around and unblock them at the end of a transition, as opposed to just dealing with whatever issues happen to come up, which relative to the number of transitions we do is actually fairly small. And also we had one or two times with really, really bad uploads and usually um, people learned if we uh, use their name or the Bindewell announce next time. <laughs> okay, I think there was another question. With the micro at least the microphone is wandering to someone. <laughs> okay, otherwise I think we are there yet at, uh, at least for our talk. Now you can have some ice cream. <laughs> okay.